Dear Lord, thank you, God, for this evening, for everyone that came out tonight, and for those that are watching online, Lord. I pray that you would go before the study, that you would go before your word, Lord, that you would touch our hearts, show us something out of it that we can apply to each one of our lives, God, that we may grow closer to you, God. And I pray that you would be glorified and magnified in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. But before we get into this book, I just wanted you all to know that my book should be coming out this summer, so keep an eye out for it. It's titled Humility and How I Achieved It. <laughs> now, of course, I'm joking. I can't write to save my life. However, there is actually a book out there called that, and I'm sure you've probably heard the phrase before. I know nothing of the book, so I can't say whether to go read it or not. But I was reminded of this phrase just last week. And speaking of last week, we were discussing what it means to be humble and what it looks like. To be humble is to be as a child, just as a child is not interested in his own status, so we as Christians should not be interested in our own status. We should not be interested or concerned with our financial status, authority and the status of our reputation, or our Facebook status. As King Solomon would say, all of that is vanity. Where we should be concerned, however, is in matters of the heart, our hearts towards God, and in doing his will. All right, let's read the first five verses in chapter 18. A little recap. In verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. The Bible condemns in a child of God selfish ambition. It does not condemn ambition. We as children of God ought to be ambitious toward the kingdom of heaven, and we should pray for boldness in going out and sharing the gospel with others. But selfish ambition, as Damien Kyle put it, ambition not out of a concern of God, a love for others, but a concern for me that I would be known as great, this is something that is contrary to what God wants in us as his disciples. We read in Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5, and do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord, but I will give your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. The word here for adversity is the Hebrew word ra. It has a long list of similar names or synonyms for it, such as affliction, calamity, distress, evil, grief, harm, Misery and sorrow, just to give you a few of the highlights. The context here is from the, the time of Jeremiah the prophet, during the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. God had given Jeremiah a message to warn Jehoiakim and the people of Judah to turn from their, work in, from their wickedness and seek the Lord, because the Lord was going to bring a destructive end to the kingdom of Judah. But Jehoiakim did not listen, and he cut up the scroll of the message Jeremiah had received from the Lord, which Baruch the scribe had written for him. And so now God was telling Baruch, who was now in hiding from Jehoiakim, that he was going to bring adversity and pluck up the land of the kingdom of Judah, where the Lord had built, which the Lord had built, because they did not turn from the wickedness and seek after him. And then God promises Baruch that he will safeguard him. Wherever you go, I will spare your life, Baruch, is what God's saying. 
And so God is telling Baruch not to seek great things for himself because it is all going to come tumbling down. Don't seek your own greatness or a great name. It's not going to last. It's all coming down. This has a great application for us today. <clears throat> Don't seek your own greatness or a great name or fame. It's all going to burn. None of it will last. This world is coming to an end. The Bible says that no man knows the day or the hour, but we do know that every day, every hour, we are getting closer to the end of this world as we know it. We ought to be focused not on ourselves and the things of this world, but on the things, but on the eternal things that will last, namely our salvation in Christ Jesus and the growth, the magnifying of his kingdom. <clears throat> now when Notice when Jeremiah was given this message for Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, God told Jeremiah that the king would not listen. And sure enough, Jehoiakim did not listen to the words of the Lord. Jeremiah's mission was a failure from the start, but all he had to do was give the seed to plant the word. And sure enough, Jehoiakim did not listen to the words of the Lord. This is also important to see just how God, just how loving God truly is. He desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What lengths God is, go, God is willing to go to, that we might be warned of our sin, and I need to turn to him for salvation. Even though he knew the kingdom of Judah would not repent, God still sent the messenger. No one will ever be able to say when they get to the great white throne judgment that they were not warned of their sin and the direction they were headed. God is always faithful. His, he always has his servants there to warn us and to speak the truth. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, we read, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. We are therefore not to be satisfied with our own salvation, that we got a ticket into heaven. But we should also desire that others come to receive Jesus for salvation. Our hearts should break for the lost and the lied to, that live without the hope of eternal life. And we are headed toward and, and who are headed toward eternal death. To rewind just a bit in talking about the disciples, the word here, disciple, means quite simply a follower or a student of something. Therefore, we are followers of Jesus and students of God's word. Now, of course, this is not an attempt to claim a title for ourselves as Christians, like in the way we spoke of titles regarding seeking power and praise these last few weeks. Rather to, be, rather to be called a disciple is kind of refreshing. It's down to earth, as you might say, and portrays a humble attitude of simply being a follower of Christ, much like the, the term bondservant of Christ. This is how we ought to portray ourselves, how we want to come across to people when we are trying to reach out to a lost and dying world. One of the most beautiful terms by which we may be called is quite plainly a Christian, which means like Christ or little Christ. We are to be like Christ. Nothing else matters. And in verse 3 of chapter 18, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you are converted, there have been some who thought this meant that you have to start life over again as a child. One such Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus was puzzled with this concept in John chapter 3, when in verse 3 we see, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, 
he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Much like being born again, this becoming like a child was not a reversion back to childhood, but rather a conversion over to childlike faith and humility toward the things of God instead of the things of one's own self or sinful flesh. To even enter the kingdom of heaven, we must have childlike humility because it takes that kind of humility to go to God, admit that you're a sinner, ask for forgiveness for past wrongs, and ask him to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. It's that childlike humility that is needed. In verse 6 we see, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. The first thing I want to point out here is that it does not say that a millstone will be hung around your neck if you stumble a child. It says it would be better for you if this were to happen compared to what you will actually suffer should you cause one of these to stumble. A mill consisted of two stones, an upper stone and a nether stone. The upper stone was turned by a donkey, whereas the nether stone or the lower stone was stationary. It's not clear as to which millstone this is referring to. However, it seems more likely that we are talking about the upper millstone that would be moving and doing the grinding. Another thing to consider is that the verse talks of the millstone being hung around his neck. The upper millstone would have a hole cut in the center of it where a large pole was used as leverage for the donkey to push or pull against, causing the stone to turn and grind the grain into flour. It's possible with this hole in the middle for a millstone to be put on someone's head and thus hung around their neck. Regardless of which stone it was, it would weigh several hundred, if not over a thousand pounds. So to have a millstone hung around your neck and to be thrown into the sea was a horrifying, crushing experience that would absolutely end in your death. However, something to think about here was that the ultimate cause of your death would be by drowning. The Jewish people were never considered seafaring people as they were deathly afraid of large bodies of water. And thus we see such deaths by stoning and other things, but they would never exercise capital punishment via drowning because of their genuine fear of the ocean. Yes, some were fishermen who would go out onto the Sea of Galilee, but that's actually a lake, not an ocean. The Sea of Galilee is a very low freshwater lake, and its maximum depth, depth is about 141 feet. So there were really no comparison to that of the, Med of the Mediterranean Sea that was nearby. It's interesting here that not only is Jesus giving a glaring warning against anyone who might stumble another person, he goes to such lengths as to even address one of the biggest fears of the Hebrew people by saying that it would be better for you that this happen than for you to stumble another person, another child of God. And to stumble is another word of saying, another way of saying fall away, to cause someone to fall away from God. In verse 6, it's speaking not only of the sense of age, as in a youth, but also regarding to a person's heart. Remember when we were talking about how in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be like a child. And so therefore, this can also be applied to Christians of all ages as being children of God. To stumble someone or to cause a child of God to fall away from him, to get involved in sin, especially a lifestyle of sin, and to possibly turn away from God was a great offense for which you would pay dearly, even with your life. We see that Jesus puts a high value on children and also seems to be making the evangelism of children a divine imperative. It is often said that, we, that as we age, we grow more and more set in our ways, more proud and less open to change. 
Thus, Jesus gives top priority to winning children to Christ, in part because it's easier to reach people at that younger age. And we know that when pride comes, then comes destruction. Perhaps this is also why Jesus says that we must have childlike faith and humility in order to come to him and to receive the free gift of salvation. We have to be able to check our pride at the door when we ask for entrance into citizenship in his kingdom. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. The Bible states plainly that there will be offenses. Offenses must come, but woe to that man. The first woe is to tell us that offenses are inevitable, but we should pray that we are not one of those people who cause the offense. We are to have no part in the offending that's taking place. The second woe is a strong word and means grief and calamity. It's a denunciation or public condemnation of that person who is responsible for the sin and evil which he introduces to another. Although evil and offenses are in the world, that is never a justification of our participation with it. Verse 8. And if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes be cast into hellfire. This may sound drastic, and that's because it's supposed to. However, it does not mean that you are to mutilate your body or to maim whatever part of your body was, be, was used as an instrument of sin. The Bible tells us that our bodies are a temple of God, and we ought to take good care of them, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19-20, through 20, where we read, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for, we're, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What this is saying in Matthew, however, is that we must be willing to sacrifice in fighting against sin, and we must deal with it radically, because nothing is worse than God's wrath. You ought to take drastic measures to cut out of your life whatever it is that's causing you to sin. For it is better to deprive yourself of something and make it into the kingdom of heaven rather than to let the sin fester, to compromise your relationship with God, and to take your body and soul down to hell. Notice the hand or the foot, which speaks of our lifestyle and the things that we do every day. We are sinners saved by Jesus through faith in him, and while we may still sin, we must be very care careful not to live a lifestyle of sin something that we do on a regular day or on a regular basis, for that hinders our ability to walk in a relationship with the Lord. Also take note of the eye, which refers to what we see, what we choose to look at, what we take in. If those things are causing us to sin, it is crucial that we stop looking at that stuff. This is a huge problem today, especially for men. This is, there is so much out there that can distract men from following after the Lord because of what's put before our eyes. And so we must be dedicated to deal violently with sin in our lives when or as soon as we become aware of it, that we may be able to have a right relationship with the Lord, having nothing in our lives that would come between us and that right standing with him. Verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. <laughs> now again, the words these little ones or children can also include disciples or all of God's children. Therefore, Jesus is sternly cautioning us to be careful when dealing with other believers or children of God. We are not to despise the faith of other believers or to threaten their faith. As we see in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, because we as believers are recipients, recipients of the Holy Spirit, 
Offenses against other believers are therefore considered as direct offenses against the Holy Spirit. Another thing here is that our spiritual well-being is so important to God. He even appoints angels to watch over us. While we do not know for certain if we each, as God's children, have one individual guardian angel appointed to us, we know that there are definitely angels appointed for the specific task of watching over us. I remember quite vividly an experience where I was driving my mom's car and took a turn too fast, causing the car to spin out of control and toward a large tree on the side of the road. I recall at that moment thinking there was absolutely no stopping the car from hitting the tree. It happened so fast, I don't even think I had time to let out a little prayer. I did not hear a crash or a crunch, but proceeded to get out of the car and assess the damage. To my amazement, the car had slid to a stop about an inch away from hitting the tree, leaving the vehicle untouched. While I personally believe that there is at least one guardian angel per person, perhaps instead there may be multiple, or maybe they even have shifts and take turns. (laughs) We don't know the side of heaven, but what I do know is that there was an angel protecting me that day from destroying my mother's car and severely hurting myself. And I praise God for it. And I also told her about it at least a year later. (laughs) While at times they may seem few and far between, there are definite moments like that where you can actually feel God's presence and his hand on your life. This was one of those times for me. And the angels are forever beseeching the throne room of God, even before the face of God interceding on our behalf. Verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them go astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, He rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Jesus came to save the lost, and here we see that God, our Heavenly Father, does not want anyone to perish. 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. (laughs) Jesus is the shepherd in this illustration, and we see here all the more just how important we are to him, that he would go into the mountains or even to the ends of the earth to seek those who are straying away from him. God will do whatever it takes to get our attention in desiring that we come to him and have a relationship with him and that you continue to walk in that relationship with him. But the scary part here is that sometimes we as sheep go astray. We walk away. God didn't move. We did. But how he rejoices when we come back to him, when we are considered found, even more so is the celebration over the one sheep who went astray but returned than those 99 who did not wander away from him. This is the God of love that we serve who we have a relationship with, and the security of our future, knowing that one day we will go to be with him in heaven. Chapter, verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained a brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. (laughs) When we believe that a brother in Christ has wronged us, we are commanded to go to that person privately and tell him how he has wronged us. If he listens, we have gained a brother. That is, we have restored a relationship with him that we may continue together in fellowship. 
I think part of why this first attempt is to be made in secret or in private is so that it remains between the two parties and should the, and should the offended party be wrong, he is allowed to save face in light of his error. Another reason addressing the concerned party alone, another concern why this is important is to safeguard that person's reputation and to avoid gossiping or slandering them. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. In court and in accordance with Jewish law, truth had to be established by at least two witnesses. This is in part why the members of the Sanhedrin brought several witnesses against Jesus when they tried to convict him of blasphemy just before they put him to death. A man's word used to be worth just about everything to him. Therefore, it was no small thing for these accusers of Jesus to lie before the Sanhedrin, forever compromising their integrity for the sake of a bribe. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 23 says, A wicked man accepts a bribe behind the back to pervert the ways of justice. Verse 17, And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. If he will still not listen to the two or more witnesses concerning the offense against a brother, take it before the church that one last attempt may be made to restore the one who has caused the offense. But should he not hear the church and have an unrepentant heart, he is to be disfellowshipped from the church, to live in the world that his sin may destroy his flesh, and he be so sick of his sin that he should come back to the church and repent, that his soul may be preserved. The word heathen meant an ungodly person who did not know the Lord, and a tax collector who was one who who was often despised and considered an outcast. This did not mean that the members of the church were to treat him as being less of a person, but simply as an unbeliever who was not a part of the body of Christ, who was not a part of that fellowship. It would be of utmost importance, however, that while they were not to fellowship with him, they should continue to pray that he return to a right relationship with the Lord. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus is saying that it is the church's job and responsibility to bind sin. Sin is bound in heaven, and therefore you have the authority to bind it on earth, just as righteousness and holiness, mercy and and forgiveness are loosed in heaven. Therefore, you have the authority to loose them on earth. Binding and loosing speak of the authority the church has in dealing with matters where sin is flagrantly practiced. We as individuals are responsible for binding our own sin. This here is talking about the church addressing something that is blatant in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, tells of a situation where sin was flagrant and blatant. This particular sin was one of sexual immorality, that of a man having his father's wife, and it was being done openly and unashamedly. This was something that could not continue to go on in the body of Christ and had to be dealt with severely. Just as a little leaven leavens the whole lump, this sin, if allowed to continue, would destroy the church. The body of Christ. It was vital to protect the body of believers from being allowed to stumble from such sin. And since back in that day there was only one church, it had to be taken care of quickly. There wasn't a church on every street corner like we see today. Casting the unrepentant person involved with sin out of that church was actually for that person's well-being, that they may be allowed to live in the world for a while, get get to the point where they were sick of their sin, and come back to the church having removed that sin from their life or their lifestyle and having become repentant of heart. Thus the church has the authority to bind sin and to loose or release forgiveness and restoration to those partaking in that sin, following their repentance in accordance with God's word. Verse 19, 
And again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. When two agree concerning anything, it will be done. Does this mean that if I get together with a brother and we both agree that we want, to win the, we want to win the lottery, that our Heavenly Father will grant us both winning lotto tickets? Of course not. The context of our agreement still has to be within God's will. If we ask out of selfish ambition, we can expect to receive nothing for it. But if we align our hearts to God's will, whatever we ask will be done. The key is that it has to be the Lord's will that we are seeking. God is not restricted, and yet at the same time we see throughout the Bible that praying for certain things together according to his will gives him the okay or the permission, I guess, to go ahead and do those things in our lives that he's already wanting us to do or wanting to do in our lives. When I was going through chemotherapy treatment and members of this local body of believers, my brothers and sisters gathered to lay hands on me. Were they not in agreement in prayer? Yes, but they also prayed for God's will to be done. And had I not been healed, would we still feel that God had answered our prayers? I hope so, because he's in control of our lives, and he knows what's best for us. It might be easier for me to say that now. But perhaps things had gone differently for me, and the only reason I was there was to share Jesus with someone at the hospital, and then God took me home to heaven. We are called to serve God wherever or however he determines is best to use us for his glory. And then when he says it's time, he calls us home to be with him. For we know that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, chapter, uh, verse 21. Far better is it to be in the presence of our Lord, but while we are still on earth, we should, we should be about our Father, our Heavenly Father's business. Verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now Peter was probably going beyond what he thought his own capacity was to forgive another person. But likely thought to himself, realistically, I may be able to forgive a couple of times, but it will sound better if I say seven. And the Jewish rabbis of the day taught to forgive a brother two or three times for the same offense. So Peter was trying to make himself out to be a whole lot more than he really was. And don't we do the same thing? <clears throat> Jesus said to him in verse 22, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seven, 70 times seven. I can just see Peter doing the math in his head. That's uh, 490? You see, by the time Peter would even get close to forgiving a person that many times, he would surely lose track. And that's entirely the point. We should be willing to forgive without keeping account of the times we've extended forgiveness because we are to be like Christ and therefore have the spirit of forgiveness. The number of times we extend forgiveness towards someone else pales in comparison to the forgiveness God extends toward us. <clears throat> therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, and when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. <clears throat> but as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion released him, and forgave him the debt. <clears throat> the first thing I see here is that the servant owed, owed his master a debt. Such was his debt that he could not afford to pay it even in his lifetime. When confronted with his debt and his inability to repay, the servant faced prison 
and the knowledge that his family would be sold off as slaves to help pay, his ma- pay back his master. But he fell down before him and begged him to be patient, promising that he would pay back everything. And his master was so moved with compassion, he not only granted the servant's request for patience, he went way beyond that and forgave all that was owed to him. I find it interesting that the servant asked for patience. Did he really think that a debt that large had gone unnoticed by his master thus far? And did he not realize that the master must have already been exercising patience with him up to this point? The servant also wasn't being honest with himself, or perhaps he wasn't being honest with his master if he really thought he could pay this back. Verse 28 But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master and all that all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers that he should pay all that was due to him. You can't earn money back in that day in a debtor's prison to repay back your debt. It was a life sentence. (laughs) This servant who was forgiven an enormous debt now becomes referred to as the wicked servant, for he went out having received forgiveness and found a fellow servant who owed him a small debt. This servant, a co-worker, if you will, asked him the exact same thing, for patience, for time to pay back the debt. The difference, however, is that this servant could have actually paid his debt during his lifetime, while the wicked servant could not. The wicked servant refused to show the same compassion that was shown toward him, denying the man the very forgiveness that he didn't deserve. The wicked servant owed a debt of 10,000 talents, whereas the other servant owed 100 denarii. 100 denarii was considered a date eight one denarii was considered a day's wage, and when taking into account the observation of Jewish holidays and the Sabbath, a Jew might earn about 300 denarii each year. Thus, the second servant's debt was the equivalent of a third of the year or four months' wages. According to one commentary, 10,000 talents would amount to approximately $16 million today whereas the 100 denarii, or 100 pence, would be about $3,000. Even though these numbers change, depending on the value of the dollar, amid other calculations, we see here that the, the contrast of that debt was so vast, revealing how sad it was that the wicked servant would not show grace and mercy toward his fellow man concerning a substantially lesser debt. Verse 35, so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Just as the servant was bankrupt in debt, we are really no different. We owe a debt of sin that we can never repay, make right, or outweigh by good deeds. The only option we are left with is to fall to our knees before our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask him to forgive us the debt we owe. If we ask that, believing in Jesus as our Savior, who is capable of forgiving our debt, he will have compassion just as this master did and wipe our slate completely clean. Lastly, if we desire to be forgiven, we must be willing to extend forgiveness to others. Remember that to enter into heaven, we must come before our master, who is in heaven, with childlike humility. If we are truly humble, we realize that everyone is equal in God's eyes 
and that we are not any more important to God than another person, and that we should therefore be willing to extend grace and mercy to all, even as our Lord and Savior does for us. This can pretty much all be summed up or fulfilled in these words. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and, as your, and your neighbor as yourself. And we get that from Luke chapter 2, verse 27. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves, and Jesus gave no leeway in this when he said that even our enemy is considered our neighbor. Therefore, we, are, we ought to love everyone the same, but in order to do that, we need his unconditional agape love, which he is willing to give us when we ask him for it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for this evening and for those that came out, Lord. Thank you for those that are watching the live stream. I pray, God, that you would keep us all safe as we go home. Um, thank you, Lord, for this day. I pray, God, that you would continue to be glorified and magnified and that you would continue to bless Calvary Chapel. In Jesus' name. Amen.